So I'm a little nervous because I've just had a lecture from Vice President Biden on the need to be lucid and uh, speak in co concepts that the bus conductor can understand. <laughs> the other thing I say, you know, um, in the southern United States where I reside, uh, my accent is sometimes a useful weapon, but here in Ireland I rather suspect it's a disadvantage. <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Henry Rodriguez here from the Cancer Proteomics Office at the National Cancer Institute, along with several others at tonight's gala, asked me to give this short commentary, and certainly to make some comments in this wonderful building celebrating centuries of medical learning is a great honor. I was asked to speak from my perspective as a cancer physician on the role, of proteogen the role that proteogenomics may play in improving cancer diagnosis and treatment. I thought I'd start by giving you some insights from my early practice in the United Kingdom in uh, the 1980s. Uh, when I was a young physician, I was particularly struck by two epidemics, one affecting predominantly men, HIV AIDS, which was new and shocking, um, and many of my friends went to work on that problem. Uh, but there was a another epidemic predominantly affecting women, breast cancer. This was a much older epidemic that had crept up on us over a century or more, and so it was not shocking, but nonetheless just as disturbing. Breast cancer mortality in the UK was reaching its peak around that time, and it was certainly sad to see all those families lose their sisters and daughters, a parent or a wife. Although mortality rates have fallen for both diseases since then due to strenuous efforts in the medical research community, it's safe to argue that progress has been greater for HIV AIDS. At least in the healthcare setting of the developed world, patients diagnosed with HIV infection now experience a life expectancy approximating that of a non-infected individual. In contrast, breast cancer remains the majority cause of cancer death in women between 40 and 60 and haunts all community, communities in the world with approaching 2 million cases a year and over 50,000 lives, uh, 500,000 lives lost annually. Certainly economic disparities haunt our attempts to improve breast cancer outcomes in the United States and throughout the world, and this is a very important issue to address. But the truth of the matter is the majority reason why we don't cure all patients with breast cancer, we don't um, sufficiently understand the biology of the disease. So why is breast cancer a more difficult problem than HIV AIDS? Well, the human genome is a million-fold more complex than the HIV genome, so that's an immediate thought. But certainly dramatic improvements in cancer outcomes are possible. Successes in leukemia, testis cancer, and lymphoma come to mind. The likely answer to our problem with breast cancer is that curability is related to biological and genomic complexity. The, the, the greater the biological complexity, or heterogeneity is the words often used, the harder the cancer is to treat. Because you're not really dealing with one cancer type. Indeed, very often in clinic, I feel I don't really know what I'm treating. So um, breast cancer is certainly not a one-size-fits-all type of cancer. And so to make progress, we must quantify this biological heterogeneity in the clinic so we can match the individual cancer profiles to precisely tailored therapeutic regimens. We know this can work. In about 20% of breast cancer, targeting the HER2 protein with a monoclonal antibody dramatically improves outcomes. Sadly, outcomes for the other 80% of breast cancer patients has not improved much in the couple of decades since the uh, partially effective treatment of tamoxifen and cytotoxic chemotherapy was introduced. So we had huge hopes that our newfound abilities introduced in the uh, 2000s to sequence cancer genomes with massively parallel uh, sequencing techniques would provide dramatic new breast cancer treatments. However, the depth of genomic heterogeneity was truly shocking. And perhaps not a surprise for us clinicians, you'd certainly seen enormous variability in the clinical behavior of the disease. A breast cancer, cancer cell can have literally thousands of DNA abnormalities of every type. And the more advanced the breast cancer was, the more complex the genome became, linking complexity to incurability. 
When we were looking at these genomes, we saw incredible numbers of point mutations and chromosomal rearrangements and amplification, deletions, and even duplications of entire genomes, all present simultaneously in the cancer. So to associate these many changes with clinical features of the disease or a therapeutic strategy or a pathway activation or a biological property like metastasis has certainly been an ongoing challenge and requires the analysis of thousands of carefully annotated cancer specimens. And to date, a new and, uh, and, and relatively common in the population therapeutic hit, like HER2 amplification, has unfortunately eluded us to date. Nonetheless, we're trying hard. The medical, industrial, and advocacy communities have organized themselves around an effort to make cancer DNA sequencing useful, yet to date, the new world of precision oncology is still a long way from demonstrating that, that next-generation DNA sequencing-based diagnostic approaches will improve overall survival from breast cancer. I think the reason why DNA-based diagnostics are struggling to make a clinical impact uh, now seems rather obvious to many people in this room. It's clear from the first whole cancer genome that we're not even close to understanding how uh, abnormal cancer genomes operate in an integrated way. The field has tended to think of cancer mutations in a reductionist way, studying each separate mutation in model system one at a time. The reality, of course, is very different, with many mutations in a cancer cell functioning in parallel. So seven years ago, I was introduced to mass spec-based cancer proteomics um, when I was at Washington University in St. Louis. It immediately seemed to me that this would be the advance we were looking for as we could potentially study the entire flux of information from the abnormal uh, DNA to RNA and then to proteins in an integrated way to, un uh, to answer uh, and study the functional readout of the complex cancer, uh, cancer genome. After all, proteins are the computer screen of life. If you don't study the proteins, you can't see the picture. However, for this to work, we needed to be able to profile thousands of proteins in the cancer cell very efficiently, very deeply, very reproducibly, including all the modifications that proteins undergo. This could never be done by producing an antibody to every protein of interest, and certainly not to every phosphoprotein of interest. So mass spectrometry was the national answer because it's sequence-based and therefore can be readily integrated into the information from next-gen DNA and RNA sequencing. The term proteogenomics for this cancer integration endeavor was first coined by uh, Dr. Richard Smith and his team at Pacific Northwest Mass Cell Laboratory in 2008. Um, and maybe I've got that wrong, but that was the first reference I could find in the literature to it. And still, there are only 334 references to proteogenomics in PubMed, and only 77 specifically addressing cancer proteomics, so this field is still in its infancy. So for the last five years, with the National Cancer Institute, we've been working towards the goal of making cancer proteogenomics useful to the cancer patients. And this groundwork was established by the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Genome Atlas, and now more recently by the SISTA program, the Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium, or CPTAC. Our first success in breast, ovarian, and colon cancer have been technically successful, and we have built new data analysis approaches to interpret the data. A key emerging principle has been the parallel analysis of model systems to follow patterns seen in those systems that can be perturbed in a controlled way to interpret the seemingly chaotic flux of information we get from studying cancers in their natural state. We have addressed the need to build new networks of tissue acquisition sites to obtain flash-frozen specimens so that the tissues are in the optimal state for downstream analysis. In the next phase of the program, we're studying more diseases, including renal cell uh, cancer, adenocarcinoma of the lung, and endometrial cancers, and brain cancer, and others as specimens become available. And I think most critically, we're beginning to study samples from clinical trials. Here, patients have graciously provided material not from discarded surgical specimens, but from biopsies they have undergone specifically so we can conduct experimental proteogenomic analysis. In some studies we're now conducting, patients have accepted multiple biopsies over time so we can study proteogenomic responses to treatment. I never cease to be impressed how much patients want to help us make discoveries, even to the point of undergoing these additional and occasionally painful procedures. 
A challenge here for the instrument makers in the room, when we began in 2006, our routine pipelines needed 100 milligrams of tissue to produce a comprehensive molecular profile. Today, because of advances in technology, a core biopsy of 10 milligrams can yield um, uh, results if done properly. Continued progress in microscaling mass spectrometry uh, is therefore required if we get to this technology embedded into the clinic. So I hope that was lucid, Vice President Biden. Uh, thank you for listening, everyone in the room. Thanks for HUPO for organizing this evening. And uh, thanks to the National Cancer Institute for funding our research.